public markets taught me to develop conviction quickly, act fast. And this is what we have here at Wellgrow. We're happy to commit into the first close. We're happy to speed up our process if needed. It's a great time to be investing. We see fundraising data. We see how many months it takes to close a fund. So this gives us as an emerging of LP an opportunity to start building relationships with the top managers around the world. And if we look at the statistics, best vintages have been post GFC 2011, 2012. This resembles to some extent these times and we are actually actively investing. The family office is three and a half years old. You've invested into 60 managers. What are some of the biggest lessons that you've had from investing in venture private markets so far? Ticket sizing in the first few deals also is a lesson for us. What do you wish you knew before investing into emerging managers? So you're at a you're an investment manager for Willgrow. What is Willgrow? Willgrow is a first generation single family office uh, based in the Baltics in Vilnius, Lithuania. It started uh, eight years ago on the back of a successful logistics uh, business called Gerteka. Gerteka nowadays is the largest asset heavy transport company in Europe. On top of that, we have uh, another operating company called Sirin, which is a uh, the largest real estate developer and asset manager in the Baltics on the industrial side. Willgrow itself is uh, one of the most active private markets investors in Europe. These days, we have a 60 managers uh, across asset classes. You have an active logistics company and real estate development company. Does that affect how you allocate the rest of your funds within the family office? Having operating businesses uh, allows us to be more aggressive on uh, illiquids. So we are heavily private markets uh, skewed on our asset allocation. Uh, currently running uh, close to 70%. What else makes you unique from other single family offices? We are emerging LP based uh, outside of a typical financial center. Uh, so I guess that that makes us a little bit less hype uh, cycle prone investor. And then on top of that, we are actively investing in fund of funds uh, next to our primary fund uh, investment practice. Moreover, being first uh, generation uh, single family office, we have uh, entrepreneurial DNA. When we last chatted, you used a football analogy to describe the different assets that you invest in venture, buy private credit. Tell me about that. Every asset class has a, has its a certain role in, in our portfolio. And probably one of the better analogies could be with the European football. So venture, for example, has a role of delivering outsized returns, delivering alpha to the portfolio comparable to striker, what strikers do on the football team take measure risks and uh, score goals, mm-hmm. then the buyouts, I would say, sort of represents a midfielder analogy in, uh, in European football. So they have a great uh, opportunity to be a strong performance, uh, but provide some stability uh, to the overall portfolio. Hence, we have a, this uh, represent the largest allocation to our portfolio. And real assets, private credit, this, uh, this more like defender, steady income generating type of investment approach. So tell me about how you went about building your venture capital portfolio. We take a three-year vintage-based investing cadence. So we just started the second cycle. In each cycle, which consists of three years, we try to build a portfolio of 15 to 17 managers, well-diversified. When you were having this discussion about venture capital, did you think about potentially doing all small funds or all seed funds? Probably 80% 80 of our time we're spending on uh, uh, small pre-seed seed managers in terms of sourcing and diligencing because this is probably uh, the most fragmented part of venture ecosystem. Our ticket sizing is, 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 is risk-based. So for uh, highest risk, uh, seed pre-seed, we, we write a bit smaller checks. For a bit uh, later stage and sort of less risky part, uh, we write a bit bigger checks. So on a dollar basis, we are rather well diversified. But in terms of line items, most of manager relationships come from pre-seed and seed uh, space. We spoke last time that one of your constraints is you are in Lithuania and you're self-aware to understand that you have to use a slightly different strategy given you're outside of the financial hubs. Tell me about that. In order to think about one's strength, you have to realize your weaknesses. So so this is uh, obviously something that we've been discussing a lot internally. We decided not to uh, build a team in London or, 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 or the US and uh, fund of funds uh, across, you know, both venture buyouts and, and, and other asset classes help us a lot. We build our networks uh, with the help uh, of them. We collaborate on uh, diligence and uh, data and systems 
what percentage of your funds are sourced through your fund to fund relationships versus directly or through other warm introductions? I would say half comes from uh, fund of funds. Uh, another half comes from other networks. But again, if you would look at uh, the managers that we backed uh, outside of fund of fund sourcing channel, their cap tables look pretty strong with uh, some other fund of funds or, or flagship uh, institutional investors. So you're able to piggyback on other institutional signals in the market. The strength of the cap table of a fund manager uh, acts as a strong signal. It's not the only factor that goes into underwriting equation, but this is a, a this is a strong signal for us indeed. There's some nuance for LPs when they look at other signals from other institutional LPs. Where are cases where you would not follow a signal from a top institutional LP? At the beginning of our venture investing, uh, we more emphasized the brand of the firm. With that, obviously, you have underneath uh, some strong institutional LPs, but we paid less attention. And uh, maybe the strength of the brand uh, and the name of the firm was uh, more important. Later, we've decided to focus uh, much more on emerging managers. So with that, uh, you know, the brand is, is still a little bit uh, unclear. And then uh, you have to extract uh, the signal uh, elsewhere. And the uh, uh, strength of the cap table of the manager acts as a strong signal for us uh, these days. Hey, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Our sponsor for today's episode is Carta, the end-to-end -end accounting platform purposely built for fund CFOs. For the first time ever, private fund operators can leverage their very own bespoke software that's designed from the ground up to bring their whole portfolio together. This enables formations, transactions, and distributions to flow seamlessly and accurately to limited partners. The end result is a remarkably fast and precise platform that empowers better strategic decision-making and delivers transformational insights on demand. Come see the new standard in private fund management at z.carta.com forward slash 10xpod. That's z.carta.com forward slash 10xpod. Me and you both share an affinity for spinouts. Why do you like spinouts so much? The spinouts typically have learned the craft of venture at a bigger firm. They made a good amount of uh, investments, you know, successfully and un unsuccessfully. They learned uh, on someone else's dollars. And uh, probably uh, there is a time when they feel uh, they need to go solo. They're also essentially making a bet on themselves. They're saying that they're going to outperform their previous manager and they have a lot of skin in the game. On the contrary, what are some of the risks that come with investing in spinouts? Sure, there are few few risks that we have to be mindful. First uh, is a GP market fit. The question is whether the manager has done uh, you know similar or the same strategy actually uh, at the previous firm. So that's important to validate the track record. Also, there is a certain element of risk in uh, in fundraising. Probably you know uh, they had the uh, investor relation people arranging, uh, talking to LPs. Uh, now, now they have to do the, that themselves, uh, being stretched in time and uh, make sure that fundraising uh, does not drag out uh, too, for too long. The third one would be, yeah, I think uh, it's ambition to scale AUM. That's one of the risks we want to discuss proactively and understand uh, how you know Fund 3, Fund 4 would look like for, for the emerging uh, manager. Just to play devil's advocate there, let's say you had a top GP spinning out of one of these very large funds and you assume that they're going to scale AUM on fund two and fund three, but fund one was right size. Would you ever invest into a manager knowing that you probably wouldn't invest in the next vintage? We haven't done that yet. I just recently had a case where uh, we clearly understood that it's a one uh, vintage play for us and we passed. And I think overall, it would be highly unlikely given that our approach uh, is to underwrite typically two vintages. Yeah, I think there's essentially it's like option value. If you hit the next Sequoia or the next benchmark, you have that you could have that allocation for 10, 20, 30 years, which is incredibly valuable, especially from a compounding aspect. The other one is relationships. You get into the, those top brands and now you're able to use that both as a track record and oftentimes the, the most kind of LP friendly GPs will also introduce you to other GPs, whether they invest before them or even sometimes competitors in extreme cases. The question is, uh, do you want all, all of your emerging managers to, to become uh, these large platforms? Uh, that's, that's, I guess, the question. If, uh, if the strategy uh, remains to be seen, but if the strategy is to focus on pre-seed and seed the 80% of the time, this might uh, also provide some, some proper churn in the portfolio. 
Yeah, I think there's probably a nuance there. You want some of them to graduate. So you could say I was in fund one of benchmark or fund one of, of light speed. And I think you also want some of them to stay the same size for kind of returns and everything. So I think they all have value in the marketplace. The family office is three and a half years old. You've invested into 60 managers. What are some of the biggest lessons that you've had from investing in venture or private markets so far? Ticket sizing in the first uh, few deals uh, also uh, is is a lesson uh, for us. So, so I guess this this combination uh, to work uh, sor- on sourcing, just wait for the best uh, best opportunities. Uh, and uh, and again, you know, as a family office, we don't have this pressure to put dollars to work. So this is uh, a good place to take these learnings and uh, move forward. What are you guys modeling in terms of DPI, in terms of getting your capital back to continue your venture program? How many years out do you think that you're going to have a perpetuating program that doesn't require external funding? On venture side, uh, DPI uh, should uh, be one X, uh, seven, eight years uh, out, uh, we believe, maybe even uh, longer. But uh, one and a half year ago, we actually set up our all uh, investment activities uh, in order not to depend on, on operating businesses. Even though venture is the longest longest one, and it will require funding from other asset classes on a on a firm level, we are uh, running independently. What other strategies do you implement in a bear market as of today versus a bull market? It's it's uh, just a great time to be investing. We see fundraising uh, data. We see how many months it takes to to close a fund. So this gives us uh, as an emerging op- uh, LP an opportunity to. Uh, start building relationships with the top managers around the world. And if we look at uh, uh, statistics, uh, best vintages uh, have been uh, post GFC 2011, 2012, 209 vintage, vintage is also pretty decent. So this uh, resembles to some extent these, uh, these times, and uh, we are actually very actively investing. Congratulations, 10X Capital podcast listeners. We have officially cracked the top 10 rankings in the United States for investing. Please help this podcast continue climbing up in the rankings by clicking the follow button above. This helps our podcast rank higher, which brings more revenue to the show and helps us bring in the very highest quality guests and to produce the very highest quality content. Thank you for your support. You had a long career in the public markets before you came over to Will Grow. What lessons do you take from your public markets investing? Investing is, is very similar across asset classes. So you just have to make sure that... Uh, Every deal uh, that you do is a great deal. You don't need to chase every every opportunity. Uh, so that's what we try to focus, be very selective and uh, build conviction uh, quickly. So public markets taught me to develop conviction quickly, act fast. And uh, this is what we have uh, here at Willgrow. We, we're happy to commit into the first close. We're happy to, to speed up our process if, if needed. Venture capital is known as an access class where it's very difficult to get in the very top funds. How do you differentiate yourself against other top LPs? We typically commit for two vintages. Of course, uh, things, uh, things might change, strategies might change, teams might change uh, at, uh, at the manager. Again, uh, our budgets can fluctuate, but this is the, the modus operandi. So we were there for two vintages. As we are active, uh, you know, three quarters in the US, uh, this gives a great opportunity for US managers to diversify their LP base. Also, we are happy to be, you know, decisive, quick, and commit to the first closing, as I mentioned. And maybe uh, finally, so we are pretty well connected uh, uh, with another family office and uh, LPs in Europe. So we made a bunch of intros uh, to our managers, and uh, actually, in some cases, uh, brought uh, other LPs uh, alongside. Should GPs in the United States look at Europe as essentially one geography or one country when it comes to connectivity and, and strategies? Yeah, it's hard. Uh, I I think no. So uh, it's very fragmented uh, market for sure. Uh, different languages, different regulations. I think uh, first step for US uh, is, is naturally London. So it's uh, closer culturally and, and, and language wise, and it's the most established uh, financial center in Europe. So uh, this is a natural bridge. But then if you lo- look at continent, it's, it's very fragmented. And for us, uh, this fragmentation, I guess, played to, to some disadvantage in, in the sense that we, we committed less to European uh, managers and more to the US because uh, in many cases, European managers, they run localized strategies bounded by geographies, which we think is not, uh, is not ideal. What do you wish you knew before investing into emerging managers? When we started, uh, emerging managers uh, were a category with a dedicated target uh, of allocation in our portfolio. And uh, at the moment, it evolved in our strategy that uh, being emerging managers is just uh, one of the features that we like about the managers. 
but without any dedicated bucket. And we benchmark merge managers to establish managers in the, in the same domain. So uh, that would be, I guess, the, the key learning and adjustment on our side. What would you like our audience to know about you, about Willgrow, about anything else you'd like to shine a light on? Willgrow is, is a small, professionally run family office who does not have a pressure to put uh, dollars to work. So we are very much focused on top quality GPs and patiently investing in venture, lower bid market, uh, buyouts and other strategies. And again, so we, uh, although we run generalist uh, approach, we spend a lot of time on cyber, deep tech, life sciences, tech bio. So happy to meet uh, folks from, from these areas. What is the main advantage of taking money from a large single family office versus an institutional investor? What are the pros and cons? You're in Lithuania. How often do you go to New York or San Francisco in the U.S.? And tell me about your strategy in terms of FaceTime. Given our base far away from uh, the financial centers, we have to travel a lot. So spending uh, give or take six weeks uh, per year in the U.S., uh, roughly uh, equally split between East Coast and West Coast, uh, where we meet our existing relationships and uh, new relationships. Building new relationships is very important for our future pipeline. Well, thank you for sharing this masterclass on single family office. Thanks, David. For more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market, make sure to subscribe below. 